Welcome to Sexy Nerdy Stuff, the series where we explore the sexy side of science, history, pop culture, and everything weird. Today we break down the history of K-pop. This is a tale of cultural fusion, teenage obsession, the iron grip of corporate power, and my inability to pronounce Korean names. Our story begins at the end of the Korean War, when South Korea is a bit of a mess. Building and infrastructure are in ruins, and the country just went through a terrible double breakup. First Korea broke up with Japan, and then North Korea broke up with South Korea. To help with South Korea's breakup woes, American soldiers and missionaries started flooding the country with sweet, sweet American pop music. Groups like the Kim Sisters, At Four, and Han Dae Su all found success mixing old Korean folk songs with new American popular music. But all of this new music really pissed off South Korea's new dictator, Park Chung-hee. Park was a hardcore social conservative. This was a guy who literally had police patrol the streets with the rulers so they could make sure women's skirts weren't too short and men's hair wasn't too long. The guy was obsessed with measuring things. I wonder if he was compensating. Park Chung-hee cracked down on any music he deemed inappropriate, which was basically everything. Remember at 4 and Han Dae-su? Well, both their music was banned and Han Dae-su was deported. Park was assassinated in 1979, only to be replaced by an equally oppressive ruler, Chun Du Hwan, who only allowed two TV channels that played government propaganda 24-7. South Korea finally became a democracy in 1987, but years of government directly controlling the media led to a very conservative pop culture landscape. Songs had to be wholesome and family friendly. Any mention of relationships had to remain about innocent topics like hugs, first love, shy glances, y you get the idea. These wholesome youth-oriented themes that stem from Korea's political history still heavily influence K-pop to this very day. Now, in the 1980s, both South Koreans consumed their music on TV, and this had three big effects. Firstly, broadcast companies could control every aspect of their artists and gave them zero creative control. Secondly, heavy emphasis was placed on musicians' appearances. You know, so no uggos get to be on TV. And thirdly, the music that people listened to was determined by the preference of the TV station, so a lot of the same bland pop ballads were played over and over. South Korea was ready for a change, and that change came in the 1990s with a group called Seotaji and the Boys. This group redefined pop music for a generation of Koreans by taking American genres of music like rap, rock, and techno and combining them with Korean lyrics. Teenagers went absolutely nuts for them. Seo Taji wrote his own music and designed his team's performances, which did away with the old studio star system overnight. The broadcast networks no longer had complete control over the type of music people listened to. But now there was a bigger demand than ever for fresh new music superstars, and so one music mogul named Lee Soo Man decided to help create them. Lee Soo Man approached the creation of his first pop star like a Build-A-Bear. Start with your base model of an attractive young man, throw some baggy clothes on him, and give the guy some hip-hop tunes. Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce your newest pop star, Hai Yoon Jae. Jin Young. But then everything went wrong. Hyun Jin Young got arrested for marijuana possession and became a criminal hedonist in the eyes of the Korean public. Lee Soo Man was not happy about this at all. He had invested a ton of time and resources into creating his pop star, and now that investment just went up in a puff of smoke, so to speak. So Lee Soo Man says, screw it, no more dealing with unpredictable artists. Wouldn't it be great if you could just grow celebrities in a petri dish to belt perfect hits and poop money? Well, Lee came up with the next best thing. He decided to create a superstar academy to create the next generation of music stars from the ground up and then push them out into the world like an assembly line. Stars were trained by the studio not just to sing and dance, but also how to behave like model citizens and celebrities. Teenagers in the program learned the perfect facial expressions, refined table manners, and the correct personality traits. Basically your standard Catholic upbringing. Trainees report grueling dance training and diets so strict their whole meal has to fit in one paper cup. But more production companies followed Lee Soo Man's example, leading to the K-pop training system that is used today by nearly every major Korean entertainment agency. A new term was coined for this new wave of corporate crafted Korean pop stars, the idols. Idol groups like H.O.T., S.E.S., and B.O.A. were embraced with ravenous attention by Korean teenagers. Some of these fans have taken their obsession so far that death threats have been sent to idols caught dating. As a result, production companies have often kept strict control over idols' personal lives. Studio contracts will ban potentially alienating public behaviors, ranging from discussing politics to dating. The consequences for breaking these contracts can be severe and range from the end of your career to aggressive public shaming. Meanwhile, the Korean government saw K-pop as an opportunity to expand their global cultural influence, so they started pouring millions of dollars into giant concert stadiums and cutting-edge hologram technology. K-pop production companies carefully follow the trends of Korean youth to stay ever-relevant and popular. The world is watching, and the machine goes on and on and on.